The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully, you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the Ensemble team and today I'm here with Cara Brett. Cara is the founder, financial advisor and wealth coach at Bounce Financial. Cara, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Look, I thought a good place to start would be, could you just talk us through your journey in advice and how you've ended up where you are today? Uh, sure. So I I did start Bounce Financial about eight and a half years ago, but prior to that, um, I worked in a stockbroking firm here in Brisbane, traveling and do all those fun things. And um, I, I was working there and I kind of looked around and went, what is this? This industry looks really interesting to me um, and ended up staying and kind of working my way through there doing RG146 and eventually a degree and things like that. So I kind of stumbled into it like I guess a lot of people did and and kind of found my way through here and then obviously starting the business a little while ago. So I've been in it longer than I care to admit, but um, but yeah, definitely found my way here by chance, not by choice. Uh, well, I can't believe it's it's been eight and a half years. It's amazing like uh, having conversations and like you, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but uh, you know, those years just, just roll on. Tell us a yeah. bit about the journey of the 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 business over over that time because I know that when you kicked off that and I know that you still are heavily into like cash flow management around advice at the time that wasn't as co- it wasn't very common at all certainly not as common as it as it is today um mm. how did you go about sort of you know planning that and figuring out what you're going to do and then how's it evolved from that yeah so I mean when we started the business or when I started because it, it was just me at the start um the plan was to work with with the younger demographics, right? And when I say younger, I talk about my demographic and I realize I'm not so young anymore, but <laughs> but let's just call it the Gen Y demographic. And because most financial planning firms at that stage, barring a few, were, were kind of older. So I went into it with that in mind. And of course, we look at the usual thing, like I was looking at the usual things that people would look at with financial planning. So superannuation, investment, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. But Every client that I saw was asking me about budgeting and about money management and some really what I considered simple questions that I realized so many people didn't really know. So it kind of evolved the way that I started providing advice and giving advice in those early years because I started from nothing, right? So every client that I got, I you know evolved how I was providing advice to them. And it ended up becoming the the centerpiece, I suppose, of what we do is this cash flow management and strategy piece and all the rest kind of plugs in the back as hygiene, really. And so over the years, we you know develop systems and processes and we have a very strategic way that we go about it and then incorporating technology into that as well by our apps and different programs to be able to, you know, be really hands-on with clients because it turns out that they 
you know, what we provide is high level of service, but they really love the fact that we're there and we can see what they're doing and we can guide them in real time about decisions that they're making uh, with their purchases and the way they manage their money. So like, it's almost like the, the clients told us what they wanted and we then listened and developed the service and the way that we do things with them. And it just got traction. Like it really, it took hold and, you know, they referred clients, et cetera, et cetera, because it's the service they actually wanted. It's most of them aren't coming to you saying, I want to look at my, you know, investments in my superannuation. They're saying, how do I manage my money and get ahead? And that's really where it, where it came from. And so practically, what does that look like for a client today? What, it, what does the journey look like? How do you get involved in their cash flow? Um, you know, what, what tools do you use and where? Yeah, cool. So I guess at the start, we, we do some pretty solid fact finding in, in relation to figuring out what their life costs to live. So, you know, a lot of people say I spend $1,000 a week and that's a lie. Most of the time, we know that it's going to be more than that. So we go through a very thorough process of getting information from them so that we can then, you know, realistically understand what they're spending, um, which most of our clients, you know, the average client is anywhere from 120 a year to 180, $200,000 a year of spending, right? Um, now, we really want that information so that we can then project out what's realistic for them in relation to other things. But how we track that is through My Prosperity. Not perfect. We use it. We've created systems, you know, reports, et cetera, to manipulate the information to line up with how we've provided advice and how we track. But then, of course, they've got access to that app. We have the data feeding through, and then we can provide them with quarterly reporting on how they are going relative to the plan. If there's anything coming up, if there's any changes, you know, we can basically say to them, you know, you're spending more in this area than we anticipated that you were going to. So do we want to change the plan and adjust the time horizon on what we're trying to achieve? Or, um, you know, change some of our behaviours to reflect the goal that we said that we had. Um, And so there is like, we're very hands-on with this kind of thing and we are making sure we're touching base with our clients on a quarterly basis for that. Um, as opposed to giving them, you know, investment updates or market updates. Yes, they get that stuff, but I think they're more interested in how they're tracking to their plan. Yeah, absolutely. I I find that obviously it's such a big part of the decision making for wealth accumulators and the main driver of how quickly they're they're making progress. Like it's great to get great investment returns, but uh, ultimately, like how much they save and how much they invest is is a much bigger driver. It is a tricky one, though, to to systemize across a business. I've found like we've been heavily into cash flow for a long time with clients, and um, I've found it to be quite challenging, particularly as we've grown our advisor numbers in, in the business to create systems. And I've tried all sorts of different ways to do that. We're also using My Prosperity as the back end, but uh, not perfect in terms of like every business, I think looks at different things and focuses on different things. So, um, how you mentioned that you sort of customize your reports and align the data with what with the things that you focus on, how, how did you go about doing that? And how do you do that in a way that's efficient for the business and efficient for the client? Yeah. So we have, I guess, um, a standardized, you know, uh, budget calculator really boring word, but from an internal standpoint, it it means that we're doing it the exact same for every client. And we categorize, we basically come up with the perfect budget for that individual client, but based on the categories that we use. Um, And there's, there's a lot of them, but we segment it very specifically. So when we're working with each client, we do it the exact same way in, in that we create the internal budget within my prosperity um, and the internal um, like headings and areas that they're spending money exactly the same across the board with our systems. Um, we input that for them. Then we set the different rules, which you know you can set. And again, they're not perfect. Like you said, we do have to do some tidying up each month on that. So even though it's personalized for each person, we do have the exact same system across the board. And what that enables us to do with our power planner is that other than a bit of tidying up, the data that we pull out from a cash flow perspective, like the, the budget data where it says how much you've spent relative to how much we've anticipated, kind of comes out exactly to match our reporting and our system that we have created for them. 
Um, so we don't really get the clients to go in and, and categorize or do anything themselves. We actually mm. physically prefer to do it for them so that it matches our our budget or our template that we like to use. And and that's kind of the best way that we've been able to to systemize it to some degree. Like it's not perfect, like you said. And if if fully open banking came across, it would make our lives easier. But we're still mm. dealing with that sort of screen scraping situation that does have its bugs and unfortunately we just have to manage that on a case by case basis but you know we're constantly liaising with them to to give them feedback on what we need and how it will be better for us so like because technology I, and I think we can all agree technology is going to play a part for advice going forward regardless like we are mm-hmm. very pro on that so therefore we want to be involved in helping shape it so you know they hear from us in terms of what we need and, <laughs> and and what we need them to be, you know, working on in the future as well. So not perfect, but it's kind of the best that we can do, but we're always reviewing it basically. It's amazing that they've been talking about this open banking for so long and it's like, it just seems like such slow going. Like you, yeah. I, I can't help but think that the banks are holding on to things or making it, you know, slower than it needs to be to get there because I feel like there's so much application for, that stuff but it just it just does not seem to be happening so fingers well, crossed. i don't think it's in their best interest is it right like yeah. from exactly. you know there's they have their own like internal tracking for you know a lot of the banks do so it's probably not necessarily a high priority for them to be sending it to a third party um mm. which i you know from a business perspective i understand but obviously for us it makes it a little bit harder absolutely how is it received from your from your clients, and do you get any any pushback from them in in getting all in their grill around their the cash flow management? Most of the time, people really like it. Like we're not brutal about it. We I always say to people, look, I'm not going to get you in trouble for ha- having KFC last night, but we we try and focus on the higher level, like as an aggregate. Like, are we loosely what you what you are supposed to be spending across the board? Um, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. If it if it's more around going, is this completely out of the scope of what we thought because it 100% changes your long-term projections, right? So mm. I think sometimes when people get their first report, they're a bit surprised. Most people think they spend less than they do. And I don't know if you have the same experience, but in, in our demographic, they, they really don't realize what they're spending. So that's always a bit of a shock and they, you know, on the odd occasion, they want to explain why they've spent things. And we, we always sort of say, look, it's, that's not really why we're here. Um, you get to spend money how you want to spend money, but you just need to understand how this will impact the rest of your plan. So most of the time, people are, are pretty good about it. Um, sometimes people just want to see it. They're, they're just happy to sort of see what it says and don't really have much to say. Um, but generally speaking, it's taken quite well, but I think maybe it's because, yeah, we're not getting them in trouble for the little bits and pieces. We just might highlight, highlight some stuff to them. Yeah. I think ultimately the end of the day, it's the client's plan, but we know when someone's working to a plan that they're going to be able to make better decisions and be more confident in what they're doing. Ultimately it's, and it's funny as you made that comment, like people say, oh, I spend a thousand dollars a month or I save a thousand dollars a month, but it's really just sort of finger in the air type stuff. And one of the things we say to people is like, we just need it. We need a starting point and we want to make sure that that's an educated one, but then we need a feedback loop to say, okay, what's actually happening? If something's out of line, it's like, do we, do we need to change the plan? Do we need to change the behavior or has something happened that's out of our control? Either yeah. way, as long as you got that feedback loop there, then it allows you to decide which lever you want to shift. At the end of the day, it's their plan. So let's just pick a plan that you're happy with and then let's work to the plan that you've picked for yourself uh essentially but it does take time to you know shift those shift and shape the, the habits and behaviors that sit around that but in in our experience i've found that the juice is definitely worth the the squeeze on that one yeah and i think like it's it's that behavior change component of it that takes longer than like that is really the coaching component of what we do you know like mm-hmm. In some respects, if we want to make sure that there is excess cash to work with, whether that's investing or whatever it is, right, sometimes it's going to um, take some behavior change. And I guess that's where we become that like grocery person for them to have these discussions. And then we have the data to back it up, right? Because it's all well and good to say spend less, but 
when you can actually say, hey, these are the areas that you're spending in. And what we want to do is try and align your spending to your values. So if you really value um, travel, then great, let's put money there. But if you don't, you know, like if you can cut back on takeout or whatever it is, right, that kind of helps to have those discussions because it's actually based on data, not just, you know, the vibe of what they're spending. Absolutely. Cara, changing gears a little bit, um, where do your new, where do your clients come from? Yeah. So, I mean, luckily because we've been in business for such a long time, um, most of our clients come from just referrals of other clients and they usually come direct to us. So referrals from clients, a lot of it comes from like social media and our, our marketing strategies, I guess. Um, we tend to find people talk about us in Facebook groups that we haven't even heard of, which is which is fun. Um, and then like everyone, we do have a few referral sources that send us it's the odd client, but it's not really it's not really something we rely on. It really just does come from, you know, natural people reaching out to us from other clients. And I know that you guys are strong on the marketing side. How, how did how did that sort of come about and what are you guys doing from a marketing perspective today? Yeah, so uh, before I started the business, I started a finance blog, so maybe nearly 10 years ago. Um, because I wanted to start getting some content together and I wanted to start practicing. And so that was really like I started this blog. I would put it on my Facebook. I did it every week um, for solidly for I don't know, well into the business, five years or whatever. And so I started with that, but obviously incorporated social media. So Facebook, Instagram, because that's where our clients are, um, a podcast. We still do blogs and we do a newsletter every single month. And I think that whilst they're all pretty like standard, uh, you know, largely boring things that people would anticipate you do from a marketing standpoint, the thing that probably has been really successful for us is that we have been consistent since day dot. So I have never not sent a monthly newsletter. I have never not had, you know, four posts on Instagram every week. Um, And I've never not had a blog at least once a week on our, you know, um, website. So the fact that we're always visible and we're always available in the peripheral of our potential clients, I think makes them comfortable that we are there, we are active. And again, I just, I honestly think it's the consistency play because a lot of people will do it for a short period of time and then drop the ball because they don't see the the exact outcome. But um, it has been so beneficial for us. We will find someone who follows us on Instagram, for example, and you can almost say that within three to six months, they've reached out to us. Yeah. So boring, but the consistency play for us has been really good. Yeah. I think it's that that virtual sort of tap on the shoulder that it's like, you're still there you know, and people think about their money. I've found I've had this conversation with a number of people that they might see something and go, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should do something about that. And their life gets in the way and then they move on. And then it's like two weeks later, it pops up again and they're like, oh, yeah, oh, I still haven't done anything. Oh, I'll probably get to that. I'll probably get to that one soon. And then life gets in the way again. And then it's like, you're still just there and still just there. And people go, oh, eventually they say, oh, I'm going to actually have to, to do something about it. But I found, like you say, that that consistency is all important. We obviously do quite a lot on the marketing side as well. And I I get chatting to a lot of advisors and they're sort of asking for ideas and and tips and saying like, how do you do all these things? And all we did was start with one thing and then just do it and and build it into the, the business as usual. And then, you know, keep going with it. And then over time, add another thing and another thing. But I think like... You, to your comment that people go wrong that they go oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start a podcast or I'm gonna start doing blogging and then they do it for a bit don't say anything and then they get distracted and there's always something else to focus on so it's easy to to get distracted but they don't build the traction and then it sort of you know starts to collecting dust in the corner and then it's all of that time and effort is is wasted and not not getting the results so 100% agree that you just pick one thing, keep at it and uh, wait wait for it to bear fruit because the great thing about marketing, it's sort of like advice. You can tweak slightly what you're doing. You get immediate feedback on whether it's whether it's doing better or worse than what you were doing before and then you can just keep constantly changing things until it does what you want it to do, essentially. I don't know if, the, if your experience is similar with that. Ah, look, 100%. And I think like, you know, you've probably had this too. There's a lot of people go, well, I don't know what to to do in my marketing. I don't know what to talk about or to put in my social media. And 
Honestly, we think about the questions that we've been asked this week from our clients and we write something about that because these are the questions. If the clients are asking us this question and it might seem really simple or obvious, then it is the same questions that our potential clients are asking themselves, right? And so if you just think about some of the emails or phone calls you got in the last two weeks, there is so much like ideas and you know content that you can put out there that helps to educate and make people feel comfortable with you um, and understand what it is you actually do. And you might be saying the same thing in five different ways over the, the next couple of months, but it might be that specific way that someone needed to hear it to um, to actually get through to them. Um, and that's that consistency thing, like you said. Totally. And it's like, as advisors, we're always saying stuff all of the time. Like we're just constantly saying things to people. So the things that you say, you know, over and over again, that's your content right there. And the things that you say that people go, oh, that's interesting. That's probably mm-hmm. a good place to start. And it's like, there's, there's hundreds of those things. So I think people really, if you, if you think about it, there's way more things that you could talk about than you're probably going to have time to actually, you know, create content around. Um, so yeah, I, I think that sometimes we can overthink it and, and, uh, think that it needs to be this, this thing that's bigger than Ben Hur, but just, uh, exactly what you said. And what are you talking about? What are people asking about? Uh, get it out there. And that has the big advantage that when someone consumes a whole bunch of that and then they come to you, they're already aligned with the things that you're saying because if they weren't, then they wouldn't be talking to you about it as well. So it means that it's easy. It's not like you get randomly referred to someone that just wants a financial advisor and then you start talking about your philosophies and it's completely inconsistent with what they've got. It's like you cultivate that person in the way that you're going to make them into an ideal client for you as well. Yeah, like 100%. I feel like most of the time when we sit in front of you know, potential clients for the first time, they reference a podcast that I that we did or an article that we wrote. And so most of the time, it's really just a formality of sitting in front of us, having the chat before they decide to go ahead. So like, it's just a great filter too for getting your ideal client. Ooh, absolutely. Cara, again, uh, changing gears slightly, I know you work with your husband. Um, I also work with my wife who works, you know, really closely together at start. It's just, just the two of us and things have sort of evolved over time. But how do you, how do you find that and how do you guys manage that at your end? Yeah. Um, so it is actually really great. And it's probably a question I get asked all the time is how do you, how do you work with your husband? I think like this plan of us working together was a plan we had from the beginning. So whilst I started the business independently and um, then continued to work as a solicitor in financial services. Um, the intention was always to bring him into the fold. And so hence the way we started, it was very intentional with that. When he joined the business in, you know, four years later or, or whatever, he came on as an advisor where, um, obviously given his background, he's, he's pretty across it anyway. Uh, So we both work as advisors and we both essentially have our own clients, meaning that whilst I see him every day and we're we're doing the similar work, we're not necessarily across each other's clients, but because our process is exactly the same and we've, it's well documented, you know, we can help each other if we have to. But I think like in relation to the day-to-day stuff, we kind of have our own clients in relation to the business management side, it's a really good partnership in that we we take off our advisor hats, we put on our business owner hats and we go and do our 90-day business planning every 90 days, the two of us, and he's got his strengths. I mean, coming from law, that's really handy for, for certain things and contracts and stuff like that. And then my background really is obviously the longer-term advice background um, and so and the different strengths that we have with that. It allows us to kind of, you know, integrate that part of it and then again we take our business owner hats and we go back into the advice the advice side and so I think because our goals are aligned in terms of what we're trying to achieve on a personal level as well as a business level it actually works really well but probably you know this as well you need to be really good at communicating um, and communicating on a business perspective and then you know switch it over to a personal perspective so that there's no um you know, no conflict on that side of things. And I think we've managed to to do that really well. 
Yeah, maybe I I wasn't so successful in that at uh, at my end. I know my wife and I almost killed each other in the early <laughs> days, um, but I feel like it probably helps that you guys are doing you're doing similar roles next to each other, whereas she was essentially like my CSO slash you know doing everything else behind the scenes. And uh, my wife loving it to death that she doesn't like being told what to do, and but she also didn't know what to do, so. I sort of had to tell her what to do. So it was a very, very tricky uh, balance to find. But um, over time, as the business has evolved, she's moved into a more strategic role in the business, particularly as we started a family and stuff. And I find that that, that side of things works well, wor- works much better. And um, I don't know, we were just chatting a little bit offline, but it's a, there's a lot of decisions to be made in a business. And um, when you're the one that's making all the decisions, you sort of get that, it's almost like decision fatigue type type stuff and sometimes you just want someone else to you know to to make a decision or to support it a decision or give it input on it so it's not just you you know doing doing what you think and um I, oh, like having a partner like uh, you know when I started I didn't have a partner whilst whilst he was there he, he wasn't really in the business and so like you said making every decision myself um which once you start getting a really big client book and it is exhausting. And so like, you know, I always used to look at people who had started businesses who had partners, um, not necessarily romantic partners, but just like business partners and, you know, they could divide and conquer. So when Ben came in, it was a bit of a relief that I could hand off some, even if they were just boring, easy decisions, like what are we going to write in this week's newsletter? I could like hand them off to somebody else and just know that it was being looked at with the same amount of care that I would give it. Um, And so that is definitely one of the benefits. And I think that as you get further in business, bigger, um, it, it would be quite exhausting as a solo business owner, whatever industry to be constantly having to make that, that decision on your own. And I guess that's where the likes of like business coaches and stuff come in as well. But um, yeah, it was it was a bit of a relief to be honest with you. Yeah, and also not quite the same. And we've got great coaches that support us, but I think that you know you've got someone that cares cares as deeply and as at, is as invested in the outcome. Like particularly, you're working towards the same sort of goals, whether it's a life partner or a business partner. Like um, I think it is a different a different sort of dimension on, on that as well. Yeah, for sure. Cara, what's uh, what are you guys working on today? What's sort of coming up for you guys? Um, so we are, I suppose, trying to um, get our business even more streamlined than it already is. We self licensed last year, and so as you probably know, that is a bit of a process and you know adjustment. So, um, and it was it was it was actually quite smooth in the scheme of things, but. That was a really big project for us. And so we want to make sure that we're constantly, you know, pushing forward with the business in in relation to making it as streamlined as easy while still being, you know, really bespoke business and probably look to hiring another person next year to slowly build out our capability. So, you know, with Christmas coming up, that's fine. We'll have a bit of a break. But I think next year is a good time to to slowly start the the progress of bringing on some new people. I'm technically closed for new business personally because I do have a full book, um, but, you know, Ben still has a bit of capability and then we sort of start talking about the next steps of, you know, do we bring in an advisor? Do we get more, you know, support staff and how do we do that? So it's I'm not 100% sure what that looks like, but it's definitely on the the next year agenda. Sounds like you've got some good uh, ninety-day planning to do over over the Christmas break. With that yes, one. it is already in the calendar, so I look forward to that. <laughs> Cara, my last question for you is: if you could go wind back the clock eight and a half years and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Charge more from the start. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I undercut myself severely, but I didn't know any better. Yeah, I think it's a journey. I know we did the, the same and we probably charged four times as much as we did in the early days mm-hmm. uh, today and obviously, you know, more inputs and, and costs increase and that sort of stuff. But 
uh, yeah, I think we put so much on, like we have these mental anchors to different, oh, we can't charge 5,000, we can't charge 10,000. And yeah. uh, then you sort of evolve past that and look back and go, shit, why was, I, why was I doing that for so long? I love it. Yeah, yes, definitely. Cara, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's great to see you guys crush it up there. And uh, yeah, thanks again for making time. No worries. Thanks, Ben. 